and what is absolutely outrageously confronting about the teaching that we hear in these three parables that Jesus told, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the well-known and well-loved parable of the prodigal son, what we learn from this is this holy God of power and might searches for the unholy and rejoices when they're found. This holy, amazing God of holiness waits patiently for the unholy and rejoices when they come home. See, that's the other part of the story that it is so, so, so important. It is not the gospel without really confronting and coming to grips and embracing this powerful truth. From a human perspective, from a kingdom of this world perspective, this is outrageous. It's outrageous. And what I want us to do is just unpack that a little bit more. Let's just start with the first few verses. Luke 15, verses 1 to 2. We'll make our way through it. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, that is Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. You see, that's the job of religion and religious people. The job of religion and religious people is to decide themselves who is excluded from God and who is not. Holy people, by their definition, are in. Unholy are out. And by definition, their definition being the operative words. And so who is this rabbi? He calls himself a holy man. But if he was really a holy man, would he be hanging around with these people? But it's very, very important. While the Pharisees and the Sadducees get a bad rap, it's very, very easy for that subtle religious spirit to creep in anywhere. And as much as we can say everyone is welcome, it can exclude so Jesus responded to their grumbling in a way that only Jesus can. He told three parables, three stories. See, what Jesus was doing, remember, Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God to earth. Jesus came to introduce people to the kingdom of God. They didn't know, but he was the word become flesh, God among them. And so his life and his actions and his teaching were to confront the spirit of the kingdom of this world with the liberating good news of the kingdom of God. And these three parables just give us another hint. So let's read on. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven, heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. How outrageous is that? <laughs> but see the key yeah oh yeah we could all say amen. we say amen because we've known and experienced that grace but what's the kingdom of this world say now nah, count your lasses you still got 99 one of them has been a little pain and been a stupid sheep and gone and got themselves lost just don't waste your effort count your losses don't you because they're more valuable you could lose time is money blah 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 you know what I'm saying but see 
hear the truth of the parable. The heart of the Father is not like that. Our God doesn't say, oh, stuff them. You know, they just keep getting themselves lost. The heart of this amazing, all-powerful, all-knowing, holy God, his heart still breaks for those that are lost. And he seeks them. He seeks after them. That's outrageous. The encouragement to us, isn't it? In our human frailty, you know, we run out of steam sometimes. We run out of patience. What a beautiful joy it is to know that God doesn't. That's why we sing what a beautiful name, what a wonderful name, what a powerful name. God's relentless pursuit of the lost. But, you know, maybe not everyone who heard that weren't shepherds and, you know, didn't quite relate to them, so he told another one. Or what a woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbours and says, Rejoice with me! For I have found the coin that I've lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The, the, the story's the same, isn't it? The story's the same. Our God, our holy God, searches for those that lost and rejoices when they're found but Jesus didn't stop there did he he told one that we know so well then Jesus said there was a man who had two sons the younger of them said to his father father give me the share of the property that will belong to me so he divided his property between them and a few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and travelled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything but when he came to himself he said how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare and here I am dying of hunger I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him father I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat together and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. And was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. That beautiful image of the father waiting, hoping, longing. This is the same holy God who created the heavens and the earth. He is so patient. And the reason I'm and so loving and so gracious, it's outrageous. It's outrageous. And the way I say that is because in our human capacity... We haven't the ability to do that. We run out. 
we run out of patience, we run out of steam. Sometimes hurt can overwhelm us. But what we draw strength on and what fires our hope is God isn't like that. He seeks the lost and he waits for them. And so, despite our frailty and his holiness, we can, as we confidently sung earlier, can say, I am a child of God. Yes, I am. But what was the common theme or word that enabled the lost and the sinful to enter into his holiness? The three stories, there was one common theme. There's, yes, and there is much rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. And the same with the lost coin, roached rejoicing over one sinner who repents. And what was it who, against, about the posture of the youngest son who enabled him to enter into the joy of the father? And know that richness. He didn't deserve a robe or a feast or a celebration, did he? But the father just honoured his humility and repentance. So we can't, if we, you know, if we eliminate that, we've turned outrageous grace into cheap grace, haven't we? Yes, God forgives and forgives and longs for us to be in his presence. Get that. He longs to commune with us. Remember, when he created the world, we were at one with him when he created human beings. Sin marred that, and God has longed to dwell among us, to be at one with us. It's our choice, not his, if we stay excluded from his grace and his love and presence isn't it it's our choice but if like David did in that beautiful song creating me a clean heart if we come before him with humility it cancels the any authority the devil has to keep us in condemnation he is an accuser he is a liar and a thief, and he loves to mess with our head, even the heads of Christians. Why? Because if he can rob us of our confidence in who we are in him, he goes, yes, because it earths the power of God to work through us. You with me? It's another part of the story I haven't finished. You know it, but let's hear it. Doesn't end there. Now the elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house and heard music and dancing, he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. And he replied, oh, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. And then he became angry and refused to go. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered to his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But this son of yours who came back, who devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead, and now has come to life. He was lost, and now is found. See, the older brother often gets a bad rap as well, but... Before we go throwing stones, let's be honest. The older brother syndrome is one we've all had to battle sometime. Far out. How can this happen? I flog my guts out. I'm a do all the right things and that. And this comes along. 
you know. And that's, but see, that's kingdom of this world thinking. See, this is the struggle. We have to live in the kingdom of this world. And there are consequences, but this is where God's grace is outrageous. You know, think about the full implications of all this. You know what that means? Let's, let's, this is why it's outrageous. You know, if, let's pray it happen, but if that guy who killed 50 people in New Zealand two weeks ago found God and genuinely repented, you realise that the Father in heaven would welcome him into his presence. He would be singing out. He was lost, but now he was found. We think far out. I haven't killed anything more than a flipping mosquito. And I try to do that and he does that. No, flies as well. Anyway. Um, but you get it, don't you? But that's, see, get that. There are people, you know, people, murderers, rapists in prison and that who, they're still, and th here's the thing. doesn't mean they get off. You know, we live in the kingdom of this world and consequences have to happen. But see, the king, and, and, and do their time. That's, we have to do that. We, ha we live in the kingdom of this world, we have to have laws. But what I'm talking about is we have to separate out the heart of our God. That's why it's outrageous. That's why, yes, it's amazing grace how sweet the sound when we're in the younger brother's shoes. But we're in the older brother's shoes. It's outrageous grace how confronting the sound. This not fair doesn't equate with our justice. And what we've got to remember is the older brother syndrome is there in the world. Because remember, and this is it, a lot of people who don't know have a revelation of grace. Have we've heard, well, you know, I'm not religious, but I've lived a good life. I'll be okay. And that... that is such dangerous thinking, isn't it? How, if, if that's the basis of getting into heaven, how do we know if we're good enough? Do I have to be a Billy Graham or Mother Teresa to be good enough because I fall short? Or do I have to be so and so? But no, I'm not good enough, but where's the line? But see, what Jesus did, friends, on the cross of Calvary is totally send that line to hell where it belongs and say, I have done this. I have given my life for you as a gift so that you no longer have to worry about where the line is. You no longer have to worry if you've sacrificed enough. No longer if you worry if you're good enough. No longer have you do that. I have got rid of that line and there's only one way into the presence of my Father and I have made that way. And the only way is for you coming in humility and repentance and receiving that gift of his incredible love and grace. What beautiful, liberating news that is. And see, the thing is, how do people get to know that? The answer is through us. Those of us who've received that grace. Those of us who know we are gathering to here today not out of any goodness of our own, but only because of his grace. We're the ones who are called, commissioned and empowered to share that through others. I'm not talking about preaching on street corners. Some people, they've got an anointing for that. Knock yourselves out and go for it. But I'm talking about the gospel that we share through our words and our actions and the relationships we build up and, 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 and what we, how we reflect lives that go against the spirit of the world. How our words and actions show a different story, reflect a different story. People can hear gossiping and people can hear judgmental stuff and people can hear condemnation and people can hear people, you know, bound by bitterness and never forgiving anyone again and all of that. They, people hear that all the time. We understand it. It's when our lives and actions reflect a different story 
the story that flows out of our own experience of his grace. That is so powerful. Paul says this. I'll finish with this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. But in case we hadn't got it, he goes on. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the ministry of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since Christ is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. You know how difficult it is in this world to be an ambassador for a country. Point oh, 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 percent of people ever get that honour, don't they? But guess what? So what? Probably no one here, well, is ever going to be an Australian ambassador to the United States or, or any other countries or all that. But guess what? We have a far greater honour and privilege that is totally undeserving but comes to us anyway. We are ambassadors of the God of heaven and earth. And our task, our brief, is to be ministers of reconciliation that we too may make ourselves available for God to reveal himself through us as the shepherd who searches for his sheep the lady who relentlessly searches for a coin and rejoices when she found it and one we so relate to if we're a parent patiently waiting for our children even if in our humanity we do want to wring their necks sometime we still don't we the heart of them we're there we can relate to that that's who we're called to be amen